Uh, Ali's on the line from East Croydon. Hi, Ali. Oh, hi there. One What's your view? I think, uh, well, I think that, you know, you are absolutely wrong in few things because, you know, it's not always the men who's to be blamed. You need to see the core problem. The core problem is with the woman, the way they dress up, the way they walk. And the way the show Ali, the Ali, morning. come on, let's not have this conversation, my friend. Why you not? cannot Why possibly believe that the way someone yeah. dresses allows, yeah. um, uh, uh, absolves a man from responsibility. That's madness. You need to understand, if people started leaving their door open, definitely the thieves will go and steal the things. It's woman modesty. Has oh, Ali, somewhere. come on, I can't yeah. take you seriously. I can't, here's the thing. Here's Ali, the thing, Ali. It, look, Ali, Ali, listen, Ali, listen to me, listen to me. If a woman were to yeah. walk down the street, you and I are walking yeah. together, a woman walks yeah. past in a short skirt, I would not yeah. talk to her inappropriately or touch her. Well, I'm not Why talk, would you? Not talk, but definitely you would look. You know, would, would you look or not as a man? You will get attracted to her. You would have that sexual feeling that you would you would want her. You know. So that's what the but, problem is. You know. But, so, so, but civilization means you control it. You, you don't walk but around sort of rubbing yourself just because you see something attractive. That's the. I mean, I, that's we've we've gone I, past that point, haven't we? I mean, look, my friend. Civilization doesn't mean nudeness. Most of the girls nowadays in the summer they are half naked. Which man will not get turned on? You know. Which man would not want to sleep with them? Which man would not want to touch them? Tell me one thing. Be honest. Put your hand on your heart and tell me whether I am right or wrong. I mean, if you see a nice girl having good buzz, she's showing off. I definitely want to talk to her. I definitely want to touch her. You know, but listen, but, but, but Ali, 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 you're talking. It's so mad. You should hear yourself. Try and be objective. Listen to what you're saying. A woman is attractive and you want to yeah. touch her, but you must be able yeah, to restrain yourself. Honest. That's just That's just being a civilized human being. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, women need to be a little bit modest. And, you know, they, they don't have to be so nude. Oh, they Ali, I can't accept this. This is not... Ali, I'm going to have to leave it there. It's this nonsense. It's, is Ali, I wonder, a walking, talking reason why these classes are probably necessary? I don't know. Deary me. The problem is, once you go down that route, oh, I saw an attractive woman today, and therefore I wanted to touch her, therefore I touched her. Who thinks like that? It's staggering. But... In the end, I've convinced myself, and you've helped convince me, I think, in the end, why we need classes like that. There seems to be a problem. It's good to talk about them, though, I think. Right, the next hour, we're going in-depth into the issue of immigration. Jeremy Corbyn wants Labour to be a pro-immigrant party. Is Great Britain a pro-immigrant country anymore, or are we turning our backs on people we should be welcoming? You tell me, 0345 6060973. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC with Stig Abel. Call 0345 60 60 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC. Very good afternoon to you, Stig Abel, here this Sunday afternoon on LBC. We just had a call about whether or not we should have compulsory sexual consent classes from Ali. Ali has made up my mind completely, make it compulsory and start it tomorrow, says Lewis from Loughton. I think there's probably a lot of truth in that. But we're now talking about immigration. Are we no longer a pro-immigrant country? Jeremy Corbyn wants Labour to be a pro-immigrant party. The Tory conference is about to start. It's already underway. Have we changed our position? Did we used to be a welcoming country that saw the benefits of immigration from an economic level, but now socially we're so caught up in fear about it, we are changing our stance entirely? I want to hear your thoughts on that. Because in lots of ways, um, immigration is arguably the most significant issue of the modern age. We're living in one of the great areas of mass migration in human history in lots of respects. The civil wars that have riven the Middle East have created a mobile mass of people seeking help and a fresh start in surrounding countries and further afield. Europe has gradually got a tighter sense of community, until Brexit, that is, and it meant that poor, ambitious from a multitude of countries are seeking a new life elsewhere. Globalisation, that modern process of connecting people ever more easily, especially through technology, has brought communities that are geographically distant in closer touch. And what has that meant for our country? We've got towns and cities like London filled with peoples of different colours and with different backgrounds. The positive is this. They collectively support our public services through taxation. They fill jobs that are otherwise unlikely to go fulfilled. At the macro level of the nation, immigrants are not only a net benefit, they're probably the main reason we're likely to see economic growth. 
But at the local level, immigration is often a thing to be feared. Why? That's what I want to explore partially in the next hour, because a high concentration of immigrants can put pressure on specific public services. Because some communities feel like their own traditions, their sense of identity, is being diluted or marginalised. Well, the first one of those, I think, is a problem. The second one of those isn't. Because I was thinking about this today. I'm someone who doesn't really care a great deal for communities and traditions. I kind of care about my family and my life and my belief that everyone should have a chance to obtain the best possible life for themselves. But I don't have a hierarchy for that. I don't want folks whose family came over in the Norman Conquest to do better than a family who came over from Poland or Bangladesh. Why, why should I? And I don't want to sound like Jeremy Corbyn here, but he said some similar things in his conference speech last week. Take a listen. Migration actually is a plus to our economy as a whole. Those people pay a lot in taxes, receive much less on average in benefits than the rest of the community and make an amazing contribution to our community. So Labour is now a pro-immigration party. Are we a pro-immigration country? That's what I want to explore with your help today. And call in 03456060973. Theresa, Theresa May, as we've heard over the last couple of hours, gave a speech about Brexit, where she touched on the issue of immigration. Have a listen. We are going once more to have the freedom to make our own decisions on a whole host of different matters, from the way we label our food to the way in which we choose to control immigration. So controlled immigration is a big deal out of Brexit, obviously. But Brexit gives us a problem, doesn't it? Because if we want economic success, we need privileged access to the single market, a condition of which is free movement. So economically, we might need free movement for two reasons. One, it benefits us anyway, and two, it will help us trade. So are you willing to accept that? Or do you feel that immigration must be controlled at all cost? People want their country back. But what is that country, really? And really, why is it important? The country's not an important unit to me family is, my life is, do I care if Britain has more people of different complexions to me who think differently to me? Why do you? You know, I do think it should be conditional on integration. This is another issue we should get into. I think people, if they want to live here, should pass a language test. I think there should be no faith schools provided by the state. I think we should live as a hodgepodge, a mix. Is it, but is that unrealistic? Clearly, as a country, as a world at large, I might as well mention the elephant in the room, there's the problem of extremist Islam. This has tainted the reputations of millions of people who otherwise we might well welcome. And I think the institution of Islam has to recognise the need for change, for reformation, for a removal of that martial aspect that has been accentuated over the last few years. It can't stay as it is. It's probably 500 years behind Christianity. It needs its own reformation, its own 30 years war. But the question remains, are we a nation willing to be a home to those who want to live here peaceably and productively? Productively. I think we are, or we should be. Do you? And what's wrong with immigration, really? Not as a bogey issue, as a veiled excuse for being racist. What are we objecting to? Because there are some reasonable objections. I want to hear some of them over the next hour. But maybe we can meet them. 03456060973. What sort of country do you want us to be? What sort of country should we be taking back? And helping me out with this, because, uh, and we're live on Facebook, by the way. You can search LBC on Facebook if you want to join us that way. But Jonathan Portes joins me. He's director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, former chief economist at the Cabinet Office and senior fellow UK in a changing Europe. So he can kind of help us with the facts of what immigration means to our country, both locally and at the, at the national level. Jonathan, lovely to see you. Good afternoon. Um, let's start on the sort of basic sort of macro level. Do you, are you convinced, do you think the information convinces you that we live in a country that benefits economically from immigration rather than, than it is, is paying the cost of it? Um, yes, I think that's pretty clear. Um, so, for example, uh, um, over the last 15 years, we've had uh, as you say, we've had a quite remarkable increase in immigration, um, and that, but that's gone alongside the same. At the same time, we've seen a quite remarkable increase in employment. So this idea that immigrants take away jobs from Britons doesn't really seem to to stack up. We had mass unemployment in the 1980s, of course, um, when actually we had very low levels of immigration. At the moment, we have the highest employment rate in recorded history in the UK, and that's for Brits. And that's at the same time as we have um, lots of immigrants coming in and taking jobs. So what the evidence seems to suggest is that immigrants contribute to the dynamism of a growing economy. They don't seem to push um, the rest of us 
British-born people out of the labour market. If anything, it's the opposite. Um, that's at the national level. At the sort of, when you Indeed. look at it from a, yeah. uh, are there communities and people will call in? If, I mean, I'd love to yeah. hear your genuine. Whenever we have a conversation about immigrants, yeah. I'd love to base it in, on genuine experience. If you have lost a job because you're undercut by immigrants or you've gone for a job and there's been so many immigrants you couldn't get a job. I'd love to hear personal experience of it because that's a kind of bogeyman that's often raised. So do call in with that 03456060973. But even if the macroeconomic position is good, that doesn't prevent there being local communities which are overwhelmed. Um, well, I mean, there certainly are going to be winners and losers from, uh, from immigration as from globalization more generally. And, and, and you made this point yourself in your introduction. Um, and in some ways, it's, you know, we have to accept that, that the two go alongside together, uh, go along together. We see, we see greater trade. We see greater economic integration. We see greater immigration. Um, on average, that makes us more prosperous. Do people who are directly affected by competition from immigrants, so for example, do um, certain trades, certain subsectors, certain occupations, do they lose out because there's more competition for jobs, potentially pushing wages down? Um, yes, they probably do. Um, I don't think that's a particularly good reason for limiting immigration because we could use the extra money that we get collectively as a society as a whole to help those people. Um, it's like it's the certainly... migrant fund that Corbyn talks about, that where you, when you identify those areas where there is pressure on services and presumably pressure on jobs because of high levels of migrants, you could use the money that comes into the economy more generally to, to, to do that. That's right. You could do it through the, something like the Migration Impact Fund, which we used to have and which Corbyn has proposed reintroducing. You could use it through special training programs or um, work program type support for people who've that lost their jobs because of um, concentrations in certain areas. There are a variety of things you could do. But I, I do tend to see this, like most economists do, a bit like free trade, right? We, didn't, we don't say, well, trade, um, a more liberal approach to trade policy is going to hurt people. It's going to hurt, say, um, people who work in the textile industry if we import uh, T-shirts from China or Bangladesh. We say, actually, we need to have a welfare system, we need to have a skills and education system that ensures that in people, people who would otherwise have worked in textile factories have a decent job to go to. And is it possible to measure the, the, the winners and the losers? Because it's clearly possible to measure the winning argument because you look at yeah. it on the, the profitability yeah. of the economy, effectively, yeah. or how, how well we're yeah. doing as a, as a nation. Can you go into communities? Because it seems to be often we're talking around the facts of this. Are, yeah. Is there statistical evidence of... Areas with large numbers of immigrants, is there statistical correlation of there being fewer British people in employment, for example? Um, not geographically. So there's been a lot of look at, lo lots of people have looked at this geographically, and there just isn't a concentration between high immigration in a particular area and higher unemployment. There is, however, some evidence of that correlation when it comes to look, look at particular sectors of the economy. So we have a paper from the Bank of England that was published recently that suggested that... Um, uh, an increase in the share of immigrants in the workforce of 10%, which is a very large number, it's more than we've experienced in the last 10 years, would push down wages for low-skilled workers in the service sector. So, for example, people working in the care sector, which is a uh, um, buy, or people working in cafes, that sort of thing, by about 2%. Um, so, And that's a real problem if you do, I mean, because who cares about the macroeconomy when you're taking home... 30 quid less a week than you would otherwise have done. Um, that's right, although 2% isn't 30 quid. Um, and what I would say is, you know, I, I don't downplay the importance of this. I mean, these are, we're talking about low-paid people who can ill afford to lose anything. But um, the, the, that sort of impact over a period of 10 years is far less than the impact of other things that government does. So, for example, the increases in the national minimum wage, on the one hand, or cuts to tax credits cuts to other things on the other, those are much bigger impacts on the wages and living standards of, of even the people directly affected than immigration. There are other things going on as well. Uh, we'll, we'll be getting into to, to, to this. Jonathan can, can look at this in a, in a kind of emotionless way, but I, I'm interested in your emotional uh, response to this because um, what is the cost of immigration? And um, We talk about changing it, taking control back after Brexit. What sort of immigration do you want to see in this country? Do you want a points system? Do you want to be only getting people of a certain qualification? And what impact will that have? Are you concerned culturally? If you care about the level of the community, and someone's just texted in to say, uh, we are a country, uh, at grassroots, we are not a diverse country. We are a country formed of communities within communities. Someone's texted in 84850. Do you buy that? 
as someone who's never really been part of a community, I'm not sure I entirely understand it because I, I come from the Midlands. There was no real Loughborough town. There was no real community there. Uh, I've obviously bounced around London for the last 15 years. There's no community there. So I don't really get this we had a traditional community and it's being tainted argument. But I do recognise it's there. So what sorts of immigration do you want and how welcoming are we now as a country? Can we ever be a pro-immigrant country again? Is that something to be ashamed of? 03456060973, text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Jonathan Porters will be sticking around for the next 45 minutes and we'll be talking about the facts as well as the feelings. I'm Stig Abel, this is LBC, it's now 5.17. This is LBC. Stig Abel, this Sunday, early evening on LBC until 6 o'clock, joined by Jonathan Porters, the Director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research and the Senior Fellow UK in a Changing Europe. We're talking about the changing world of immigration. What sort of country do we want to be in terms of immigration? What's the downside? You know, Jonathan was saying uh, earlier, I was asking him, generally speaking, there is a massive contribution made by immigration at the macroeconomic level. It, it's part of our growing economy. It's part of uh, our success as a nation. So at what point does it become of concern for you? My position from an emotional point of view is that, and someone said, you can stick your patronising fear line, this is my country, and I didn't give Lib Left a mandate to destroy it with mass immigration, says Beth Dawson on Twitter. Uh, my country is the bit that I sort of struggle with. Why do we care so much about our country and our history? Um, seems to me to be interesting. But what sort of immigration do you wish to see is the question. 03456060973. Darren's on the line from Welling Garden City. Hi, Darren. Afternoon, yeah. Totally disagree with you, Stig, and your, uh, and your guest as well, both on um, the, the actual idea of countries and also the uh, economy. Go on, then. Uh, first on, on countries, um, what, what it seems uh, that you're calling for is a, a sort of new world order whereby there's no, there's no borders, no states, I, I like to. I, I'm a bit nationalistic. I suppose I'm a little bit tribal. Yeah, I, I'm in touch, I get that. I'm in touch with my roots. Do, I mean, do you do you follow football? I mean, are you a football fan? Yeah, I am a bit. So you'd you, you'd be happy to see the end of the World Cup then? Because what would be the point of, of, of the World Cup if there are no no? I, if I go to France, I want to enjoy the, the, the different culture, the different language, the, di the different food. You know, uh, what, what you're calling for is a, a complete... Yeah, I'm not really calling for that. that. I'm, all I'm saying is I, I don't think that the sort of fetishization of it is that important to me. But do I think that... I'm not saying that there should be no nation states. I'm simply saying that that notion isn't a driving force behind me. I'm not tribal like you. I do understand the tribal argument. So do you feel, as someone who's a little bit tribal, that, the, that your country is changing? Absolutely, yes. I feel that uh, we are moving into what you what, what you described as like a hodgepodge of just a big, uh, basically a grey uh, future whereby there is uh, just one government, one currency, and um, slave work. We'll all become slave workers, a rush to the bottom, and just big corporations uh, ca calling the show. That's what you and Jeremy Corbyn and I believe even Theresa May are all calling for. Um, I, I, I think we should, uh, you know, turn the clock back. Um, let's uh, re-establish our sovereign nations and our communities and our states, and all enjoy the differences among, amongst us, and not not uh, have the, uh, the advantage taken of us from from uh, uh, bankers and the elite. But do you do you think that uh, there's no economic benefit to migra high migration? No, I think the only the only people that have benefited from mi migration are the, the likes of, of your Starbucks uh, and your, your big Uber, your big corporations that are, that are taking advantage of uh, the rush to the bottom and, and the minimum the minimum wage. Which it's almost like communism. We've moved into into communism. You know, you, we talk about free trade. Actually, it's the complete opposite of free trade. We, we, it, it, it's, it's, it's like a monopoly. Every every yeah. sector of industry is. Um, well, I think that's capitalism, probably, Darren. Not communism in the end that's got us into that position. Jonathan, that, that, I think it's important we try and deal with this issue of the economic benefit. Mm. He says it doesn't really benefit uh, ordinary people, it benefits big companies. Do you think there's any sort of factual basis for that? Um, well, not really. Um, I mean, companies Be honest, do John, benefit. No, but, not, yeah. <laughs> um, co of course, companies do benefit. Some companies benefit more than others. But ultimately, uh, um, uh, as you say, you know, we are in a capitalist economy um, and we rely on companies. 
uh, we rely on the profit motive, we rely on, on private enterprise um, to deliver us jobs and ultimately increased productivity and increased wages. And on the whole, the evidence suggests that immigration promotes over time more economic growth, increased productivity and higher wages overall on average for us. But as I said, that doesn't mean that some people don't lose out. We have to accept that. Graham, uh, we're live on Facebook at the minute. You can search LBC on Facebook. Graham has said, Jonathan Portes, that's you, Jonathan, spouts about how much EU citizens pay tax. Fact is, they are all low-skilled workers paying no tax and everything topped up by tax credits and housing benefits. And if they have kids, all the rest of the benefits. So they are a drain on our benefits system because they're not paying enough tax because they don't earn enough money. Um, well, that is simply false um, because, um, and we know this uh, from some, some very recent data published by uh, by the uh, Her Majesty's Customs and, and uh, Excise Refu- Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which actually compared the amount of tax and national insurance paid by citizens coming from the European Union with the amount that they claimed in tax credits and other benefits. And the ratio, I haven't got the figures to van, the ratio is, is something like five or six to one. They pay about five or six times as much in, in tax as they claim in benefits. Now, of course, they make other demands on the welfare state. They use the NHS to some extent and overall. But the idea, um, uh, uh, which has been floated by some, that somehow um, none of these people are paying tax or they're getting much more in tax credits or other benefits than they're paying in tax, this is is just complete and utter nonsense. It's just not true. And there are going to be younger as well, tend to, because they yep. tend to come out, and therefore their demands on the NHS will, you know, in a, yes. in a general sense, be, be less. Yes, they, they make far fewer demands on the NHS, and of course they don't claim pensions, although if they stay here for all of their lives, they will eventually claim pensions. So you do have to look at these things over time. But all the evidence we have so far suggests that the, the overall impact is pretty positive. Philip's on the line from West Drayton. Hi, Philip. Hi, oh, yeah, um... My point is, I, I do believe in a control in immigration, and also feel there's a greater emphasis should be made on integration, because everyone has a fear of the unknown. It's a natural, it's a natural human instinct. You fear the unknown. If you don't know someone's culture, then you're not going to understand it. Then you're going to fear them, and then you're going to segregate them. Yeah, I agree with that. But here's a, here's a, here's a problem. So I think about this quite often, Philip. Is that enforced integration? kind of feels a bit of a paradox because if you're kind of compelling people because i feel you know, as i said there should be no faith schools everyone should speak uh, english if they want to live here but sort of compulsory integration does that not kind of take away the the, the benefit of it well i'm not saying compulsory integration i'm not saying oh everyone meets at the community center and everyone does this once a week it's all about coming back to the sense of talking to your next door neighbor i mean i come from an area that's predominantly white predominantly uh, a well-off area but i'm talking about maybe if you go to sort of inner cities that that culture of going to talk to your next door neighbor knocking on the door i mean checking that checking you're all right that will in turn bring that integration on yeah I mean, well and, and that that's a two-way process philip isn't it because if people come here and don't wish to integrate and a group of us here don't seem very welcoming that's very hard to achieve isn't it it is hard to achieve. Yes, it is. It, I completely agree with that. that it, it's, it's not a simple thing and it's not an overnight thing, but it's a thing that requires a lot of thinking from a lot of different community leaders and a lot of different uh, political leaders. And it's a bit above my, my pay grade in a sense, but it's a conversation that needs to be had from a, from a, from a leadership point of view and brought down, down the scale. Yeah, that's a fair point, Philip. Grace is on the line from Ealing. Hi, Grace. Hi. Hi, what's your view? We really, really need to keep in mind that there is extreme injustice in the world because of companies taking from each other for centuries um, and companies still exploiting poorer parts of the world. We here in the UK, just by the luck of the draw, are living in far better conditions than much of humanity. And so obviously we don't have space for everyone, I understand that, but we ourselves as individuals need to have more of an attitude of compassion. We're very, very lucky and we need to stop being so selfish and assuming that we somehow deserve to be having a better standard of living just because we happen to be born here. But, but you, your, your view there, Grace, just kind of chimes with mine a little bit in the sense that that man called us earlier to say, uh, I think it was Michael, to say, oh, I want to create a new world order where we have no nations. But you're kind of saying, like me, that, that in some ways the national identity is less important than a sort of common humanity. Common humanity is always more important than nationalism, obviously. It's not fair that we're born in 
such a nice country and other people are suffering so much and we can help them and most of the people that come to this country they work flipping hard they don't just use services they work very very hard and what we need to do is to try to accommodate them and the government needs to try and do that in a sensible way yeah no, grace i don't disagree with that uh, jonathan um, do you think they talked about integration briefly there is there a requirement of people to speak speak English already? Um, there is a requirement for the vast majority of immigrants who come from outside the European Union. Um, so if you apply for a work permit, a visa to come to work here, a visa to come to study here, a visa to come to uh, in order to marry or settle down here for family reasons from outside the European Union, you do basically have to speak English. Of course, that do- because of the free movement rules, um, we, as long as we're within the European Union, um, then you can come here from elsewhere in the EU, um, and there's no requirement on you at all to, to speak English. That said, I think a, probably, you know, a majority of people who come here from within the European Union do either speak English or make some effort to learn it. Most people, you know, when they come to live in the country, they want to have an idea what's going on. They need to be able to get around. So they do tend to want to learn English, but there's no requirement on people from within the EU to learn English. That will change, of course, when we, when we leave. Um, Final uh, point on, um, well, not a final point, but an economic point. This issue is clearly covered by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, says Chris in Bristol, texting 84850. Only the business owners and elite benefit in an increase in workers. So effectively, more workers come in, the business elite do better, and the country doesn't benefit. But presumably, we now live in a country where hopefully the taxation system means a distribution of economic benefit. That's right. The tax system redistributes some of that economic benefit, and other means of government policy uh, uh, can do so as well. I mean, I do not think um, Adam Smith would have been very sympathetic to the idea um, that the best way to uh, um, to in, to to enhance the interests of workers, which he was very keen on doing, of course. He, he was on the side of the workers in many respects, but he would have been very unkeen on the idea that the way to do that would have been to restrict the uh, the free movement of people any more than he would have thought that he would have do it by restricting the free movement of goods. How interesting. Well, um, keep your calls coming in, 03456060973. I'm asking you this question. Are we a pro-immigrant country anymore what have we lost and what sort of immigration can we get behind here is it a certain type of person are you concerned and let's call it out for what it is are you concerned about the security levels of bringing in people of an islamic faith that you fear to be too martial if that's what you fear we should talk about that is your concern economic deprivation on indigenous people that they come here they take our jobs they deal they they put too much pressure on our social services what are your concerns what sort of country is Great Britain now when it comes to immigrants? 03456060973. And if you want to ask questions of Jonathan Porters, please do. He's the director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. He can answer questions about the, the economics of it. We'll try and stick to facts here, apart from when I go gibbering on as well, so we can talk about what sort of country we are. 03456060973 to join the conversation. It is now 5.32 here on LBC News. Stig Abel on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. What sort of question, what sort of country are you is the, are we is the question that we're trying to deal with now. In terms of immigration, are we still a pro-immigrant country? What sort of immigration do we want to see? And what is the net effect of immigration when it comes to the facts. Tess has texted in 84850. It's not... Uh, go down East Ham High Street, loads of layabouts. I can take you to an area where they don't work and live off benefits. This is a fact. But Tess, that's not a fact. That's an anecdote. The facts, Jonathan Porter who joins me here, the facts are... And we keep saying this, but I think it's worth reiterating. Explain the methodology. How do we know, or we think we know, that the net benefit of immigration is there rather than the net cost? Well, I think... I mean, uh, you know, that, that's a very big question, but uh, um, you can come at it from sort of two t- directions. And I think the easiest way for me to explain it, including to myself, is actually not to use numbers at all. It's to say just what you've said a few minutes ago, Stig, which is, look, most of these people, um, particularly immigrants from, from Eastern Europe, but also most people who come from outside the EU, are coming here to work. They're not coming here to claim benefits, either because they are not allowed to or because they don't know about the benefits system. It's not their main benefit. They're coming here to work, um, and they're mostly young, uh, um, especially the ones from from Europe. Um, They're of working age. They get a job. They contribute to the economy through working in a job and also through paying their taxes. Um, What, on the other hand, does the British state 
what do our taxes, yours and mine and those of the immigrants, actually pay for? Well, overwhelmingly, what uh, our taxes go to pay for are pensions um, and the NHS. And remember, overwhelmingly, the NHS concentrates its resources on older people. Older people cost the NHS far more than relatively young and healthy people. So it's hardly surprising that people who are youngish uh, and likely to be in work are going to be paying in on net, whereas people who are older... Um, and sicker um, are going to be taking out on net. That's not saying anything about the morality of anything. It's just a fact. So the fact that immigrants on average are going to help pay for the rest of us is sort of basically common sense. Now, on top of that, we have, as I said, you know, going down to the very detailed level, we have the sort of detailed statistics that, that HMRC produced just a couple of weeks ago where they just look on their computers and say, you know, look at national insurance numbers and say, actually, you know, uh, the immigrants from the European Union pay about six times as much in tax as they claim in tax credits and other benefits. So you can also approach it from that sort of try to add up everything. But I think it's easier just to look at it from the top-down point of view. Um, Sandra's on the line from Bedford. Hi, Sandra. Hello, Stig. What's hello your there. view? I just, I, yeah, hello. I just wanted to quickly say that um, uh, i tell you where resentment sets in. It sets in when people live off their credit card and they can't, they wouldn't get a social house, they wouldn't be entitled to social housing, and people are coming in, and they're having houses, and they're having, to, it's claiming on child benefit, and all different types of benefits, but anyway, the thing I was going to say, Stig, was, um, like, I think there should be a, an amnesty for illegal immigra- immigrants, and I, th- I think we really need to find out, if we can, how many people we have got here illegally first, before we do anything, I know we can't, but even if, even if, 3,000 turned up and we said, OK, there you are. We're going to give you a temporary work permit. We accept that you're illegal, but we're going to give you a temporary work permit and then asylum seekers too. And you're, going to, you can, you're very welcome to stay, but you've got to work. And uh, your children can come to our schools if that's, you know, that's fine, but you're temporary here. Um, I think that's where, it's going, where we're going. Here's going. the thing I think what happens, Andrew, is that we can hear all the ec- economic arguments from people, yes. but then if we think, if we've had an experience or we feel that there's, we've seen people who seem not to be from this country taking a benefit without paying back yes. in, we feel angry about it. Jonathan, I'm, Sandra, is the issue of illegal immigrants. Is there any sense of, of how many we have in, in this country? And illegal immigrants are people who ha- yes. are failed in their attempts to become refugees via the asylum process and then they're asked to leave and if they stay when they've been asked to leave they become illegal immigrants. Is that right? Um, well, that, those people are uh, um, Ill- Ill- illegally here. That's correct for the most part. Um, but they're probably not the vast majority of illegal immigrants. The vast majority of illegal immigrants, all the evidence suggests, are actually people who came here perfectly legally on some sort of visa which did not permit them to stay permanently. Remember, any American or Australian can simply walk into the country without a visa um, and, you know, we, we don't kick them out afterwards. Um, if they stay here beyond the three months that they're entitled to, they become an illegal immigrant. Similarly, people from other countries, Brazil, Pakistan, Nigeria, can come here on tourist visas or family visas or business visas. Again, those are supposed to be time limited, but we have no necessary way of knowing that they're still here. And if they stay on beyond the expiry of their visa, they become illegal immigrants. So those people, rather than people who've been smuggled in the back of a lorry or people who were failed asylum seekers, they make up the vast majority of people who are here illegal. And what's the cost of those? Do we have, is there any way of measuring the cost of it? Because presumably they enter that sort of grey economy or... or, or they, they enter the grey economy. Um, they, I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not suggesting this is a good thing politically, morally or legally, but there's no necessary reason to believe that there are costs because, you know, they may be working illegally, they may still be paying tax even if they're here illegally, they may still be contributing to the economy and they may well, you know, they may be using services, but on the whole, illegal immigrants tend to steer clear of services. But we do have some estimates of the number, and they're actually not that large um, in terms of population as a whole. The most recent estimate came up with a sort of number in the region of, say, 600,000, so 1% of the resident population. Um, Now, that's not an insignificant number, but it's far lower, say, than the US, which, with four times the population, has perhaps 12 million illegal immigrants. Uh, John's on the line from Mill Hill. Hi, John. Hi, Steve. Hi, Jonathan. Um, Immigrants of of any sort of colour, creed, or, or wherever they're from, or whether economic or not, I have no problem with. If if they come to com- contribute, 
and uh, and the government of, of the day will try and keep up with the infrastructure, as in the NHS and schools. I do have a concern, though. Uh, you mentioned, Steve, about the elephant in the room earlier on. Um, and an example of that, to me, could be a uh, call that you had at the end of the last hour, uh, Ali, who uh, wasn't too happy with what he would see on the streets. Now, if I was working in Saudi or Pakistan or somewhere where there was a strict code of dress and rang the LBC equivalent there and spoke to Stig, your, your equivalent there. I'm not sure in Saudi that would be a particularly uh, free speaking, <laughs> speaking radio station. <laughs> but uh, but if, I was to, if I was to ring up and complain that uh, I, I couldn't see enough and that uh, ladies were wearing too much, I, I think it would be just as ridiculous. Yeah, and we don't know where Ali's from. Look, there, 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 there is an issue here about uh, what happens when cultures uh, come together. And this exactly. way, integration, I think, is an issue. But how, whether you can compel integration, John, seems to me to be almost a critical issue of the, the age. Because you, you, d you don't want to deprive people of their cultural identity, but no. equally you want them to be part of our country. No, I think you, you do. You do want people to have their own, keep their own culture. I mean, we, we wouldn't have all such great music and food that we do in this country, especially in London, uh, if we hadn't allowed that. But I do think that uh, there's a little bit of, uh, I mean, that, when in Rome, the, the, the Australians for years went on about whinging poms, didn't they? Uh, uh, because they wanted us to uh, integrate into, into their society there and not keep moaning about how great it was back here. Yeah. Uh, one quick point, though, for Jonathan, um, uh, you, you, about the illegal immigrant side, Jonathan, there was, they interviewed uh, an ambassador in the United States over tr Trump building a wall to keep Mexicans out and, uh, and pointed out that the GDP of the United States would go up by uh, so many trillion if they were to legalize all the illegal immigrants. And uh, did the, the ambassador agree? And he said, yes, of course I agree. He said, we'd be far better off but then it would send out a signal where the floodgates would open. And I think there's a point there to, to consider. Is there a saturation point, Jonathan? That's an interesting point, that if you were to uh, allow all these people in, you'd actually get a benefit to the, to the GDP. Is there a point at which it goes, it no longer is a benefit? Well, I think there's two points there. There's a point your caller was just making, which is correct, which is that the risk of having an amnesty for illegal immigrants is that you deal with the problem you have, but you create a problem in future because... People think that, well, if I come to the UK and I can stay long enough, I will be legalised. There's a difficult trade-off there, and there's no easy answer. I personally think that some form of limited conditional amnesty, as the previous caller suggested, makes a certain amount of sense. But I don't think we should persuade... You know, there's, no, there's no easy answer there. On your, your other point, is there a sort of tipping point? I mean, I think you know there are people who think that we should have purely open borders and that that would be at least from a global economic perspective or perhaps a moral perspective, a good thing. I think, you know, um, even those of us who are relatively pro think immigration is a good thing economically just think that's not politically econ or economically realistic any time in the near future. Or socially. Or socially. I mean, it just would not work. And there's no point in, in, in thinking that, that that's a sort of sensible policy for any, any conceivable government. So you have to have some form of, uh, you have to have some form of regulation. You have to have some form of control. Um, I think that the argument is between those who want to have a very tightly controlled system, uh, what I tend to do, who think that somehow we can centrally plan all of this and decide exactly who we want, exactly who we're going to take and, uh, and regulate the market that way, and those like me who think on the whole we should have a fairly liberal market-oriented approach, still have rules and controls, but try and make the system work rather than target particular numbers. Uh, Jonathan Porters will be with us for the last part of the show. Do keep calling in loads of you called... And the simple question is, what sort of immigration are we seeking in this country? 03456060973. I'm Stig Abel. It is now 5.48. This is LBC. Coming up at 6 on LBC, Clive Ball. Theresa May has opened the Conservative Party conference with a speech outlining her Brexit policy. She promises Article 50 will be triggered within six months and announced the Great Repeal Bill to put law back into the hands of the British Parliament. The critics say she still hasn't got a plan and the ministers are divided. So has the Prime Minister said enough to convince you. Leading Britain's conversation, Clive Ball, this evening from 6 on LBC.
Five thirty six. We'll look at I'm Stig Abel until that point. Uh, Jonathan Porter's the senior research fellow at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research and the senior fellow of UK in Changing Europe is with me. Uh, Chris has texted eight four eight five zero. If your guest is an economist, can and he is, can he enlighten us on supply and demand for labour and what UK wages would now be without freedom of movement of people? So. Can you answer that, Jonathan? And then presumably we can get into what will change if we restrict yeah. freedom of information, freedom of movement. Yes. Um, so immigration adds to labour supply, obviously, because you've got new people coming in into the labour market, typically looking for jobs. Um, but what people forget is that immigration actually adds to the demand for labour, because these same people um, earn money, consume things, go out to the shops and buy things, create businesses. Um, so immigration adds to both supply and demand. How does that balance out? Well, in the UK, it seems to balance out pretty well, that it is it adds just as much to demand as it does to supply. Um, so what does that mean would happen if we restricted immigration to wages? All the evidence we have so far suggests that it would make very little difference. Um, wages overall wouldn't change for British people, wouldn't change very much one way or the other if we had uh, fewer immigrants. Now there would be, as I said before, um, uh, there would be some distributional effects. Some people would gain and some people would lose. Um, so, for example, some, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, the care sector, where there are now quite a lot of, of new jobs are taken by migrants from Eastern Europe, it's possible there might be some upward pressure on, um, on wages in the care sector, perhaps baristas in cafes, again, lots of those are Europeans. Um, equally, there would be downward pressure on, on wages in some areas. And paradoxically, it's not just about supply, you know, it, it's not as simple as you think. My own profession, um, economic research in London, is has a huge number of immigrants. Do I think that I would benefit personally if we kicked all these immigrants out and there was less competition, I, you know, that I was, it was easier for me to get a job? Um, actually, I don't. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons there is so much economics research in London is precisely because of immigration. Having the immigrants here means there's just more business, more money to go around for all of us. So it creates the market as well. James is on the line from Croydon. Hi, James. Hi. What's your point? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, I, I, I take issue with uh, Jonathan's, uh, you know, comments about contributions, etc. In, in pure financial terms, um, my my understanding is that um, the average um, immigrant, on average, you know, as men, women, children, uh, contribute about two thousand pounds in tax uh, after benefits. Now, if you look at the overall cost of uh, central and local government, it comes to about £12,000 per person for all 65 million. So a shortfall there of about £10,000 per person. Now, if you multiply that by the number of uh, people from Europe, as we're specifically sort of concerned about European immigration, that's about £35 billion in shortfall. Plus, of course, there's the infrastructure cost, which is, you know, housing, hospitals fire engines, you name it. And, and that's got to come to, to, to several trillion. James, so, got, uh, let's go, you made a point there. Jonathan, do you, do you so effectively that they don't contribute uh, more than they take out, both in real terms and in infrastructure costs? Um, well, I'm afraid that's just not true. I mean, you can only get that by double and triple counting some of the costs and ignoring some of the tax revenues. So, uh, um, you know, by ignoring things like VAT and all the other taxes that, that all of us, including immigrants, pay. I just go back to my basic point, which is that on the whole, um, young people in work pay into the system in this country old people and sick people and, uh, who are out of work um, who for the, the vast majority of whom I'm afraid are not immigrants uh, tend to take out and that, that's just the way it balances out. James? Um, yeah, no, I mean my, my, my sort of corollary to that is of course young people have children and families and there's an education cost and so on and so forth with that so I'm not sure I accept okay, that. Okay, yeah, that's what no. said to me about maternity care that yeah. immigrants are always having babies and therefore they <laughs> cost more in maternity costs. Um, well that's true um, and, and that is one of the uh, uh, but I, you, we should also note that maternity care although it's significant is a pretty small proportion of the overall NHS bill very small compared to uh, elderly care but James's other point that of course immigrants have children get old and become just like the rest of us um, is quite right and I do think you know we shouldn't overstate the, uh, 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 the, the positive impact in the long run of immigration on the purely fiscal sense um, you know immigration is not helps with the problem of an ageing population and demographics. It's not the solution. We have to work that one out for ourselves. Uh, Muhid is on the line from Crayford. Hi, Muhid. Hi, Dick. How's it going? Very um, good, thank like you. To, um, 
No, thank you. I'd just like to give my perspective on immigration and integration. Yeah, go I'm for it. I'm 30 years old. I was uh, born in London. My parents are immigrants. I've contributed to society. I've got a job. I've got a degree. I've got my own place in Crayford, England. I've got my own place. I've got a mortgage. I'm a society integrator. So, do I contribute to the system? Let's have a think. Well, if we talk about culture, what is the culture that I see around me? I'm going to look at my neighbours. I live in Crayford. They're all English heritage. What do they do on their nights out? Drinking, clubbing, eyebrow waxing. That's not really my thing. However, what is my culture teaching me to concentrate on family, looking after the old, giving to charity? They're the I do. If anything, the English should be copying me and integrating into my culture. Second to that, when it comes to the aging population, everyone under, I mean, sorry, not the aging population, it's what James was talking about with contribution to families and such things like that. I'm an immigrant or son of an immigrant. I'm 30 years old. I have zero kids. I'm looking down my high street on Bexley Heath. And I see all the single mums with multiple kids on the 30 years old. In my perspective, who's having more kids, the educated immigrants or the uneducated indigenous? Uh, how, so, do you, how welcome did you feel, Muhid, uh, coming here from, and your family coming here? Right, so I was born and raised in Dulles, not too far from Peckham, lots of uh, ethnic population there. Very, very welcome. I moved to Crayford, 95% white, English. I made my best to stay polite. People look at me as if I'm taking their land, I'm taking their jobs, I'm taking their cars. Excuse me, I've worked hard to get what I'm doing. If I can work hard and get what I'm doing, son of a non-English-speaking immigrant, how come you, English-speaking indigenous, can't get a job, can't get a house, can't get a car? What is your issue? There's more of you than there is of me, but I'm succeeding and you're not. Okay, but I think you've very articulately put in why it's very impossible to generalise.